right now on Justice. The Border Patrol agents, these are incredible people. They endorsed me. Donald Trump focuses on core issues. They've warned that Hillary Clinton's plan would put the entire country in grave danger. While the attacks fly in from every direction. Donald Trump is nothing more than a two-bit racial arsonist. Tonight, my live interview with Eric Trump as the campaign gears up for the first debate with Hillary Clinton. Then, I'm at Modell Sporting Goods and I am practicing because I think it's important that any commander in chief needs to be in great physical shape. Just how important is a president's health and stamina? I get physical to find out. It's tonight's Street Justice. To be commander in chief, you have to be able to lift the big ones. Justice starts now. Hello and welcome to Justice. I'm Judge Jeanine Pirro. Thanks so much for being with us tonight. Eric Trump is standing by to talk with me in a moment, but first, my opening statement. This week, Hillary's all better and she and her surrogates call on all Americans, all but us deplorables, that is, to stand up and repudiate Donald Trump's divisive rhetoric. How? through their own divisive rhetoric. For five years, he has led the birther movement to delegitimize our first black president. Donald Trump is nothing more than a two-bit racial arsonist who for decades has done nothing but fan the flames of bigotry and hatred. Donald Trump, however, begs to differ. Hillary Clinton and her campaign of 2008 started the birther controversy. I finished it. I finished it. You know what I mean. President Barack Obama was born in the United States, period. Reports are, though, that Hillary's surrogate, Sidney Blumenthal, a chief campaign strategist, and others actually started the birther business, and Hillary apologized to Obama for that. So wouldn't that make Hillary the racist? But what's race got to do with this anyway? The birthplace of the president is a constitutional issue. Hillary Clinton is so desperate for the black vote that she insists on creating race issues. Under the guise of outreach to African Americans, Trump has stood up in front of largely white audiences and described black communities in such insulting and ignorant terms. Poverty, rejection, horrible education, no housing, no homes, no ownership, crime at levels nobody has seen. Right now, he said, you can walk down the street and get shot. You know, Hillary, isn't Donald Trump speaking to the problems of the minority community in the inner cities? Maybe your recent health issues have prevented you from grasping the reality of inner city crime, like that on the south side of Chicago, where young kids drop out of school because they have no hope of a future, join gangs, get guns, and engage in all-out war. And what have you and Barack Obama, whose policies you promised to continue, done for that community in the last eight years, where African Americans have a higher unemployment rate than when he started? A predominantly black city that has just experienced its most violent month in nearly 20 years. Where are your law enforcement efforts to stop this carnage? Your economic efforts to improve the quality of life in that community? No. You choose to create division. You look for a target, the police, Donald Trump, a common enemy. And then you promise the world. And you have the gall to actually say, quote, imagine someone who distorts the truth to fit a very narrow view of the world. Imagine a president who sees someone who doesn't look like him, doesn't agree with him, and thinks that person must not be a real American. Close quote. Hillary, the 
that's exactly what you said last week when you called us deplorable because we didn't agree with your vision. We were not America. Now, I know you have double vision and problems with your memory, well documented by the FBI, and that you short circuit frequently, but your hypocrisy is stunning. You're the hater here. You're the one planting the seeds of division. You're the one calling the kettle black. I know you have memory problems from your concussions, the blood clots, the dizziness, the dehydration, whatever. But you're the one who said, we're above all that. You're the one who wanted to be the inspirational candidate. The one who said, we're stronger together. Yet you do nothing but spend all your time savaging Donald Trump. And if I didn't know my history better, I would think he actually started the Civil War, which, by the way, was a fight between Republicans led by Abraham Lincoln, who were anti-slavery, and the Democrats who wanted to keep their slaves. But honestly, Hillary, I don't blame you. Almost 70% of the country thinks that we're going in the wrong direction. And you've got nothing but more of the same to offer. What do I mean? A few facts. The economy sucks, but you're richer thanks to your foundation. We now face the greatest danger in the form of ISIS, you know, the one that grew under your watch. And your cure? You're going to get more intelligence. Our allies can't rely on us, some of whom have had to go to Russia to buy arms because under your State Department, they couldn't get them from us, or maybe they didn't make the appropriate contribution to the foundation. Our enemies don't fear us because we give billions to them. You guys want to hate Putin, but you're the one who did the Russian reset. Hillary, you got a one-way arrow pointed backwards that slapped on your forehead. But I don't blame you. You're not even remotely up to the job. You don't even know how to save a classified document. Your own State Department lost $6 billion, and you don't have a clue where it is. And even if you did, I wouldn't believe you because you're a liar. And while we're at it, Hillary, tell your surrogates to stop pouncing on the fact that my friend Donald is 15 pounds overweight. At least he admits it. And that's my open. Tell me what you think on my Facebook page or Twitter, hashtag Judge Janine. And joining me now by phone from the Trump campaign is the executive vice president of the Trump organization and Donald Trump's son, Eric. Good evening, Eric. Good evening, Judge. All right. Neck and neck. It's a horse race right now. And uh, here we are uh, just one week uh, from the debate. What is the most important group that the Trump campaign needs to attract at this point? Listen, I think, uh, I think hardworking Americans, they're the people my father has spoken to this entire election cycle, and they've been totally left behind by Washington, D.C. In the last 15 years as a nation, we've lost one-third of all our manufacturing jobs in this country. We have 100 million people out of the workforce in the United States. Median income uh, in this country hasn't gone up in 16, 17 years, meaning... People are making the same or less money today as they were 16, 17 years ago. It is so, so sad. We're losing all of our jobs. People are working harder. We're being taxed more. Um, all, our pro you know, all our jobs are going overseas. It's just a very, very sad thing. So my father is talking to hardworking Americans who have been left behind by the policies of the Clintons and the policies of the Obamas who have really just forgotten about the American people. You know, um, Eric, there's been a lot of talk about the ground operation and the fact that uh, uh, the Trump campaign doesn't have the ground operation, and it's certainly not that it's expected to, given the fact that Hillary's been running uh, for years and years for president. Uh, but that um, it seems, though, that the swing states uh, actually have uh, an increase in the number of Republicans who are actually signing up or registering to vote. In, in, in a huge way. I mean, if you look at voter registration all across the country, and especially in the swing states, it's skewing very heavily toward the Republicans. But I find it ironic. Hillary spent her, her life either in L.A. or, or in the Hamptons doing $100,000 fundraisers. Hey, last night, Bill Clinton had a, a fundraiser where you couldn't go to it unless every person donated
donated two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and we all know where where that money is going. Yet my father is out there three or four times a day doing rallies in front of fifteen, twenty, twenty five thousand Americans who are excited and you know and thrilled and who are behind his movement. And it's a different way of campaigning. She'll raise hundreds of thousands of dollars and run smear ads, not about what she's accomplished in 30 years of being a politician, because there's very dismal track record, but instead trying to smear my father. And I think my father's doing the exact opposite thing, where he's taking his message to the American people, and he's getting in front of the American people, and he's working incredibly hard. And that's why we're going to win come November 8th. I mean, it's just why we're going to win come November 8th. Well, I think that there is a startling distinction, Eric, between uh, your father's campaign and the issues that he's talking about, whether it's the economy or child care or immigration or, or foreign policy or what he did with the, uh, with, with the uh, generals, some of the gold star uh, 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 fathers that, that we heard from uh, this week. And, and she is not talking policy. She's just talking trash. But, uh, you know, it, it seems that she is now uh, in a position where she can't really rely on her record, so she really doesn't have anything else to talk about. All right, that's exactly right. I mean, listen, she's sitting out there saying, we're going to put coal miners out of business, and she's, you know, obviously very anti-law enforcement. She's turned her back on our law enforcement. She's turned her back on our military. I mean, just time and time again, she turns her back on the American people. At the same time, she's profited hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars off of the American people through pay-to-play scandals. And, I mean, it's just really, really horrific. It's All right. really the most deplorable thing in the world. I want to get to the debate prep. Now, you know, we've got just over a week before that first debate, which is going to be huge, uh, and it's one that I think will turn a lot of people. And since there's a very small margin that both camps have to try to convince, how's your dad preparing for it? And, um, you know, Hillary Clinton, I can't imagine, uh, given the fact that she has said so often that your father is unfit, she's got to get to him and make sure that she shows the American people that he doesn't have the temperament. Is he ready to blow that off if, when it comes? No, oh, absolutely. My father is preparing, and he's preparing um, hard. You know, and he doesn't do it by based on memorizing sound bites. He does it based on talking to really intelligent people and formulating great plans. But you want to look at what's unfit. Unfit is calling half of all hardworking Americans irredeemable. I mean, unfit is destabilizing Syria and Iraq and Egypt and pretty much every other Middle Eastern country. Unfit is allowing our servicemen to, you know, die on a roof in Benghazi because, you know, they wanted to keep cover for themselves and they wanted to lie to the American people. And quite frankly, they didn't want to make a tough call. Unfit is the leading 15,000 emails and lying to the Department of Justice and lying to Congress and lying to the FBI and everybody else. But I mean, Unfit is running one of the largest Ponzi schemes in American charitable history. And, you know, I think her record um, is a toxic record. And I think everybody understands that. And I think my father will certainly be spending a lot of time talking about that. Okay. And, and very quickly, I mean, given that your father is, is all over the place, I mean, I, he goes from one state, one event to another, and she's very quiet and kind of behind the scenes. Um, it, it, your father is prepared. He is. Is he doing debate practice, Eric? Oh, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. And very important. He realizes it to be, you know, very important. And but he does it in his way. Again, not memorizing cue cards. He does it by talking to great people and surrounding himself by great people. And uh, he'll certainly be ready. And he's done a phenomenal job in the debates. And I just, uh, I, I have uh, no doubt that he's going to do amazing come uh, come next Monday. All right. Uh, well, we all day. look forward to it. Eric Trump, thanks so much for being with us this evening. Take care, Judge. All right. And with me now, my political panel, Democratic strategist and principal of the Dewey Square Group, Marianne Marsh, and Republican strategist and CPAC chairman, Matt Schlapp. All right. Good evening to both of you. It is, uh, as I'm sure you both said, I know, Marianne, you certainly have, and uh, from the beginning, it is a horse race. It is neck and neck. The debate is just over one week away. Uh, and right now, both of them preparing for the debate, uh, Marianne, how did she get under his skin? Matt, uh, is he in her head? I'll start with you, Marianne. 
Well, I think, first of all, what's so interesting about this debate is we've never seen anything like it. We've never had a woman be the nominee for any party for president. <clears throat> we've never seen the likes of Donald Trump. And this is the first time every voter in America and many people around the world are going to get to see them on a stage, side by side, take their full measure. I think the challenge for Hillary Clinton is she's a very good debater, but Donald Trump's a great performer. And we've seen that throughout this campaign and certainly uh, in the Republican debates. So I think for him, She's got to get under him and ask him questions on policy. What are you really going to do to create jobs? Not just believe me. What are you going to do? What are you going to do on taxes? How are you going to get people back to work and better paychecks? I mean, really specific questions. And he can't just blow them up by saying, believe me, big time, going to do it, trust me. The American people want to hear more than that. Well, and I, and I think that some of the speeches of late are part of the reason that his numbers have gone up. We just saw that Fox News poll, he's up one. But, but Matt, how does he get into her head? Well, uh, she doesn't seem to like him very much, uh, and I think that's gonna. I think that's gonna play to his advantage. I think one of the things both of these candidates have are obviously high negatives, and uh, Hillary Clinton is not exactly a warm and cuddly figure, and I think she has to somehow come across to the American voter out there that she's not this kind of cold, heartless, 25-year government bureaucrat who's gotten rich. Uh, while she served. And I think she has to come across as someone who's empathetic and warm. People who know her, Marianne, tell me that she's very likable. It just does not come across. And I think she's got to be able to do that in order to put this race away. And I don't think she can. And, but he also has a <clears throat> difficult uh, uh, position, being a man c competing with a woman. Matt? Yeah, you know, that's right. George H.W. Bush faced this with Jerry Ferraro. Mm -hmm. And at several points in that vice presidential debate, uh, back, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, she chastised him several times for, you know, talking down to her and patronizing her. She used that word. You know, that's a card that a woman can can play very deftly. And I expect Hillary Clinton to try to do the very same thing. And and Michelle, I mean, how do you expect Hi uh, Hillary to handle that? I mean, I am sure Donald understands the parameters as it relates to her, given the Lazio from years ago, that mess up. Well, look, I, I think as much as Donald Trump has a fine line to watch with Hillary Clinton, if he's dismissive of her and gives her the Heisman on certain things, <laughs> Hillary Clinton, on the other hand, has to pick and choose her spots. Voters want everyone who's going to be president of the United States to stand up for themselves, because if they don't see you defend yourself, then they think you're not going to defend me. And I think for Hillary Clinton as a woman, that's a fine line to walk as well. That's why this whole debate, we can all try to predict what it's going to be like. None of us know, because we've never seen anything like it before. Before. And that's really the has to be the exciting and all, also the unnerving thing for both these campaigns. Oh, yes. That first debate will be huge. Marianne Marsh, Matt Slab, thanks so much for being with us this evening. Thanks, Judge. Thanks, Judge. All right. And next, the case against Hillary Clinton is very much alive. Congressman Jason Chaffetz, chairman of the House Oversight Committee, sits down with me to talk about who he subpoenaed to testify this week and why the email case could still cause some big headaches for Hillary. And then, to run for office, you have to be able to take a beating. You also have to be able to give a beating. <laughs> and then I hit the gym for street justice to ask Americans just how important a candidate's health and physical fitness really is. Let's pump some iron as justice rolls on. Do you think either of the candidates are really in good physical shape? No. Why do you say that? Their doctors say they're in good physical shape. They're old. 